Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Welcome everyone uh, in our first global webinar from Itcon Institute. We are uh, highly glad to have our uh, respected and beloved Sheikh Smile Kamdar in our as our uh, guest speaker today. Alhamdulillah, at first I am going to introduce uh, Sheikh Ismail Kamda to all of you. Although Sheikh is a very renowned and well-known person in Bangladesh, but uh, as this is a global webinar, I think it's better to have a short introduction as well. So Sheikh Ismail Kamda, uh, uh, he uh, began his study of Islam at very early age, at the age of 13, and he completed seven-year Alim course and uh, uh, he joined the Islamic Only University as a senior lecturer as well as the faculty manager. And he worked there uh, from February 2010 till October 2020. And currently he works as a research manager at Yaki Institute. And over the past decade, Sheikh Ismail has served as a school teacher and administrator in multiple schools in South Africa and India. He has also delivered lectures and workshops in many locations locally and globally and appeared on many radio stations across the globe. He has also served as a radio presenter at Radio Al Ansar for several years until November 2016. In 2011, Sheikh Ismail uh, discovered the importance of personal development and noticed a lack of Islamic literature dedicated to this field. After uh, uh, carrying out further researches on this topic, he decided to uh, start uh, his own works uh, and he decided to work elaborately on this topic. And among the most famous books of Sheikh Ismail is the Having Fun the Halal Way. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this book has been translated in Bengali and uh, where uh, there's a very good response among the Bengali speaking people regarding this book. Also, Getting Baraka and Islamic Guide to Time Management. This has been also recently translated in Bengali and published uh, some days back. Uh, and uh, Best of Creation, an Islamic Guide to Self-Confidence, uh, Homeschooling 101, and we all, uh, all know that uh, Sheikh Ismail is uh, doing very good and making uh, good resources uh, on homes homeschooling. And he has uh, written a Productivity Principle of Umar II, that is Umar ibn Abdulaziz, and some uh, other books as well. So today, uh, now I want to uh, want our Sheikh Ismail to uh, take the slot and start his uh, valuable lecture on self-development, the Sunnah way. Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Uh, so inshallah, I assume everybody can see my power point presentation uh, that's important because this uh, um, this presentation is going to be rather content heavy right um, I'm taking a very different approach to how I usually present this topic okay so the topic of personal development self-development self-help um, in general when I presented this topic in the past I would only cover uh, what is the Islamic perspective and what I'm going to do today is slightly different. I'm first going to discuss what's wrong with this field. Right? This is something I, I didn't discuss much in the past. What's wrong with the current approaches in the West towards personal development? And I've been doing a lot of research in this area over the past two years. So a lot of this may be new for many of our uh, listeners here today, but I believe this is very vital and important for us to understand why an Islamic approach is necessary. Right? If you don't understand what's wrong with the Western approach, we may not be able to see the need for an Islamic approach. And I've had people approach me and, and they've, they've told me things like, uh, why do we need Islamic self-help? You know, the, the, the information in the regular self-help books is good enough. And the reality is, no, it's not. It's not good enough. There are some things obvious and some things subtle that are un-Islamic. And that's really what I want to focus on in the first half of today's presentation. In the second half, I'm going to present to you my model and my methodology uh, for deriving an Islam Islamicized uh, curriculum in personal development. So how did I develop my, uh, my paradigm for self-confidence, the Islamic way, or time management, the Islamic way, or personal productivity, the Islamic way? I have a set system that I use, and I will present that in the second half of this presentation. 
So again, this presentation will be in two parts. Part one is what's wrong with personal development. And part two is how do we Islamize it and do it the right way. So to begin with a few definitions, what is personal development and what is self-development? Well, they are two commonly used terms uh, in this area, which are in some ways synonyms and in some ways slightly different to each other. Those two terms are personal development and self-help. So personal development is, you know, any activity that helps one to improve one's capabilities or achieve one's potential or become a better version of oneself. So generally, anything that you do to grow into a better version of yourself is categorized as personal development. So then what is self-help? Well, self-help basically means helping yourself to do this. Right, where you get your own books or you get uh, articles or, or videos, whatever it is, but you find a way to help yourself achieve your life goals. So these two terms, they overlap, but they also are slightly different from each other. Personal development is not always self-help. Sometimes it's through a life coach. Uh, sometimes it's through a set a system of study under a teacher. Sometimes it's with a mentor. Sometimes it's an apprenticeship. Uh, there are a variety of different ways to go after personal development. And self-help is one of those ways, which is you are helping yourself to grow by reading books or working on yourself or self-counseling, self-therapy, something of this nature. So on the surface, this looks like a very good thing. Obviously, I mean, we all want to grow we all want to achieve our goals. We all want to achieve our dreams. We all want to grow into the best versions of ourselves. So what's wrong with the field? Why do I feel there's a need to Islamize this field? Well, many people may not realize this, but the current model of personal development stems from a variety of Western ideas, many of which are un-Islamic. And if you aren't aware of these ideas, you may not be aware of how they affect the field of personal development. So one of these ideas that is un-Islamic and that affects our understanding of personal development is the concept of uh, individualism. And this is really the big one. I actually want to go further into this, inshallah, in the future. This is one of the areas I'm researching at the moment, uh, individualism and its impact on the ummah. So what is individualism? Individualism, uh, as it has evolved over the past 20 to 30 years is this idea that it's all about me. Life's about me. It's my goals, my dreams, my rights, you know, my passions, my whatever. It's all about me. And this started off as something okay, you know, where maybe parents were forcing their kids down career paths they didn't like. And they say, what about my goals? What about the things I'm interested in? Okay, that's understandable. But now it's reached a point where people say things like, oh, I don't need to respect my, uh, my parents. And, you know, I didn't ask them to give birth to me. I didn't ask them to raise me. It's not what I want to do. You know, so it's become a kind of worship of the self. This is really what it's becoming in our times. And this is very problematic that a lot of, uh, a lot of the concepts in the world today stem from individualism. A lot of the problems in the world today stem from individualism. The high divorce rates, uh, the amount of people who don't want to get married, the amount of people who don't want to have children. If you look at the reasoning behind it, for a lot of people, individualism is the root cause. And it affects personal development as well. So if you look at personal development, the Western idea, it's all about me. It's all about my goals, my rights, my ideas, who I want to be, what I want to accomplish. And anybody who gets in the way of that is evil. Anybody who gets in the way of that is bad. So it becomes a a sense of worshiping yourself, of conflating your ego. And many people don't realize this. Many people don't recognize this. They view this you know, as, as just the way the world is or always was. Now, this is a lot more problematic in the West than it is in the East. In the East, uh, particularly in Asia, for the most part, most cultures are still centered around families and tribes and community, which is the Islamic way. Uh, but as you move further towards the West, as you, as you move towards Europe and the USA, individualism is becoming a major problem. And many of the books that reach you 
on personal development are written from this perspective. And this is very, very dangerous for our Iman and even for the Ummah, because you lose that sense of Ummah and you develop a sense of it's all about me. The second major problematic uh, mindset that uh, affects personal development is capitalism. So in capitalism, success is defined by wealth. If, if you open up a Western book on, on personal development and you look at, at what is success, it's defined as being a millionaire or a billionaire. Uh, there is a lot of focus on material success. And Islamically, there's nothing wrong with material success. But when it becomes the purpose of life, when it overrides uh, one's uh, relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it causes one to choose haram methods, when it becomes an obsession, all of this is problematic for the Muslim. So Muslims are not capitalists, nor are we communists. We are Muslims and Islam is somewhere in between the two, where on one hand, we do believe in the free market. We do believe in, in earning halal wealth, but we also believe in serving the community. We also believe in, in giving back and we also uh, believe in a sense of uh, of a sense of contribution to society. So it's, it has its own unique paradigm towards wealth. And many of these books that we read, they come from a capitalist perspective. Number three, linked to capitalism is materialism. So what is materialism? Materialism is the idea that to enjoy life, to have fun, you need to, um, you need to uh, you know, have nice things. So if you don't have a nice car, you can't be happy. If you don't have a big house, you can't be happy. And so materialism is all about ownership of this world, owning lots and lots of dunya. And again, this is not the mindset of a Muslim, that a believer is supposed to be content. A believer is supposed to accept the qadr of Allah. A believer is supposed to be happy what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him or her. So we, we know this materialistic mindset, it's found throughout many of these Western personal development books that they talk about owning the special cars and, and owning huge houses and owning your own private jets. It's a very materialistic idea of what is success. Number four is postmodernism. Now, this is a new idea that many people are unaware of, but it, it finds its way into many of these personal development books. And postmodernism is the idea that, well, it's a very broad idea, but the part of it that affects personal development is the idea that there is no such thing as truth. There is no such thing as purpose. Uh, there is no way of finding the truth. Everything is just you know, up to you. You define your own truth. You define your own purpose. You define your own life. And I think for anyone who's a Muslim, you can obviously see the problem with this uh, mentality. Right, because we, as Muslims, we know the truth is from Allah. Uh, we know there is definitely a set truth and falsehood. We know that our lives have a purpose. So, a lot of these books that we read nowadays come from a very pessimistic, postmodernist mindset that nothing matters. You just decide for yourself what you want to matter. You just decide for yourself, you know, what your purpose in life is going to be, uh, because there is no truth and there is no uh, good and evil, and all of this nonsense really to a believer all of this is nonsense uh it is found in many of these books a final problem that we have with personal development today is pseudoscience basically a lot of these authors just make up their own things that have not been proven in any way and people read it and they believe it so it's not science and it's not uh proven it's just somebody writes something and everybody believes them. And this again is problematic because as Muslims are supposed to seek out true knowledge, authentic knowledge, not just believe anything that reaches us. So these are five ways in which the modern personal development field is problematic for Muslims. And many of us, we pick up a book on time management or self-confidence or achieving your life goals. And we don't realize that these different mentalities are affecting the author of that book. That that author may be, may be a postmodernist, he may be a capitalist, he may be uh, affected by individualism. He may be making up his own ideas or, or, of how the world works. And we read it and we absorb it and we think it to be the truth. And this is a problem. Let's look at some examples of that, right? So there are some, examples uh, that I can uh, uh, give you about uh, how these things uh, affect the believer. So number one, uh, they inspire greed. So obviously, any personal development book 
that comes from a perspective of materialism and capitalism is going to make you greedy, right? They will tell you that you are not successful in life unless you are a millionaire or a billionaire, whatever it is, right? Every artist has got their own definition of success. And so someone who may have up until that point been living a happy life, worshiping Allah, contributing to society, providing for their family, suddenly they feel like they can't be happy unless they are millionaires. And this opens up the door to greed, which we know in Islam is something that is frowned upon and something that opens up the doors to many different types of sin. Uh, another problem with this field is that it causes us to feel inferior to other people, right? So what does that mean? It means like, many people who may have otherwise been content uh, when they look at the field of personal development and they read these books they may begin to think like oh i'm not good enough i'm not doing enough with my life uh, you know i'm not as good as this guy or that guy look how much he's done look how much she's done and you begin to feel like you are lesser than them and this can really make a person depressed uh, it can make a person feel like you know they have to be doing something grand otherwise they're not they're wasting their lives and in reality not everybody is meant to do something grand. Not everybody is meant to be on a big stage. Uh, really, our lives are about Allah. It's about worshiping Allah. It's about doing things that's pleasing to Allah. Uh, so, you know, we should be careful that we don't fall into this mindset of thinking that unless we're doing something grand, you know, we are wasting our lives. That's not true. You could be doing something very small that nobody in the world sees you doing, but Allah could put, put barakah in it and it could affect and, and benefit millions of people without you even knowing. That's really where the believer uh, works. It's not all about, you know, being on the grand stage or having a lot of followers or anything like that. It's more about doing things that are pleasing to Allah and to have barakah in it. Another problem with the personal development field today is that it distracts us from the true purpose of life. So when people have this idea that it's all about uh, you know, achieving my goals, achieving my vision. That so, for example, maybe somebody's vision is to be a billionaire. Well, that now becomes their purpose in life. That becomes their obsession. That's all they think about. Everything they do is now geared towards becoming a billionaire. The problem then is you're not actually fulfilling the real purpose of life to worship Allah, to earn Jannah, right? Now you fall into the trap of al hakumut taqas or hatta zurtumul maqabir. That this competition to pile up the things of the world, distract you until you die. That's what happens. So this is one of the problems that happen when you, when you go too far into this field without an Islamic paradigm is that the purpose of life becomes mixed up. Instead of the purpose of life being to worship Allah, it now becomes to get rich or to set up this or to do that or whatever it is that a person derived from that book. And finally, it creates unrealistic expectations. Because if you read many of these books and they say things like everybody can be rich and everybody can be famous and everybody you know, can have millions of followers on Facebook. And that's never been the way the world was and that's never, that will never be the way the world ever will be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even states in the Quran in many places that he distributes his risk amongst the people as he wills. He gives some more fame than others. He gives some people more honor than others. He gives some people more money than others. He gives some people more influence than others. And that's the way the world has always been. And that's the way the world will always be. Uh, the idea that anybody who picks up a book on how to get rich quickly is going to get rich quickly is absolute lie. That's what it is. It's a lie. It's, it's, it's not going to work. Everybody has the potential to get to Jannah. Everybody has the potential to please Allah. Everybody has the potential to pass the test of life. As for getting wealthy, well, our money, the amount we are going to earn from the time we die till we pass away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already predetermined it. How hard we work, that really decides on whether that money has barakah in it or not, whether it is blessed by Allah or not. But the idea that everybody can be wealthy, that has never happened. That has literally never happened in the history of this world. There's always been various levels of society. And whichever level we are at, you know, to live a life that's pleasing to Allah is what's most important, not to be obsessed with wealth. So these are some of the problems that come with the field of personal development. Firstly, from the, the mindset of the authors, they may be individualistic, uh, they may be uh, caught up in uh, 
postmodernism or modernism, they may be material, uh, materialistic or capitalistic, uh, then there's the problems that it has on us, it may make us greedy, it may distract us from the purpose of life, it may make us feel inferior to others. So what's the solution? And that's really the core of today's discussion is the actual solution from my side. And this is a paradigm that I put together uh, for Islamic self-help. This is what I use for writing my articles, preparing my lectures and writing my books on personal development. I use a paradigm, an Islamic paradigm for uh, personal development. So number one, we have to have to always remember that the purpose of life is to worship Allah. And anything that helps us to worship Allah is good for us. So this is why you'll find in almost every book I have written, I have a chapter or at least a sub chapter on the purpose of life. It can be a book on time management or self-confidence or productivity. I always try to include a chapter on the purpose of life. Why? Because this is the most important thing for a Muslim. We cannot be distracted from this by anything else. Every, everything else is secondary to this. Right? Whether we get wealthy or not is secondary to whether we achieve the purpose of life. Uh, whether uh, we have a large following or not is not even secondary. It's like not important at all. Right? What's important is that we worship Allah and that we live a life that helps us to do that. Now, anything that helps us to do that is good for us. So for example, financial independence. Financial independence helps you to worship Allah, does it not? And so that's why we have a lot of hadith encouraging financial independence. Uh, there is a beautiful hadith in which the uh, Prophet ﷺ said, whoever seeks to be financially independent, Allah will make him financially independent. I mean, whoever seeks to earn enough that they are not dependent on others, Allah will open that door for him. Uh, there's another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ taught us a beautiful dua, which we are supposed to recite every morning and evening, Part of the dua is, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-kufri wal -pakri. Oh Allah, I seek your protection from disbelief and poverty. Note, the worst thing of the akhirah, disbelief. The worst thing of the dunya, poverty. We ask Allah's protection from both. Why? Because financial independence helps us to worship Allah. When we are worried about money, it's very difficult to worship Allah. It's very difficult to focus on the purpose of life because we're worried where we're going to get our next meal from. We're worried how we're going to pay our rent and all of that takes over. So anything that facilitates the worship of Allah is good for us. Whether it's financial independence, or whether it's time management skills, whether it's self-confidence, whether it's personal productivity, all of these things are only good for us when they help us to worship Allah, not when they take us away from that. Number two, excuse me for a second. Apologies, it's uh, summer here, so it's really hot. Okay. So point number two, our tazkiyah or tasawwuf, our purification of the soul should be our second priority after the worship of Allah. And of course, the worship of Allah is how we purify our souls. But worshiping Allah is the primary goal. And the benefit of that is the purification of our souls. And so as Muslims, if we are not, uh, when we are not focused on the worship of Allah, what's the secondary focus of our lives? Purifying our souls and improving our character. So anything that helps us to do this is good for us. Anything that takes us away from this is bad for us. So if a personal development resource is inspiring greed or jealousy, this is against the purification of the soul. This is damaging to the soul. So we have to be careful of this. But if it is teaching us to be good to people, if it is teaching us to have good character, if it is teaching us integrity, this is good for our soul, this is good for our character, and we can incorporate this into an Islamic paradigm. Number three, serving the ummah is more important than chasing one's own goals. And this is where Islam goes against individualism. Individualism, it's all about me. It's my goals, my life, my rights, you know, my time, I can do what I want. That's the individualistic mindset. The Islamic mindset, Allah has created me as part of the ummah. The ummah has rights upon me. What can I do to benefit this ummah? And so you will see the big difference between someone who is attitude is I need to serve this ummah as compared to someone whose attitude is I need to achieve my goals. And as a believer, we should always be ummah focused, not me focused, right? So this again is, is 
a very different paradigm for how we will approach personal development. So while um, a Western book may have, uh, you know, in setting your goals, a lot of things to do with yourself, what do you want to do? Uh, which countries do you want to travel to? Uh, what kind of house do you want to live in? Right? It's all about you. But with an Islamic book, it would be more about how can I benefit this ummah? You know, can I do work that's constructive? Uh, can I teach something? Is there something I can, I can do for free? Is there something I can do to volunteer my time? Can I set up a walk-off? Can I set up a non-profit? What can I do to benefit the ummah? The ummah is more important than me. This is one of the uh, key parts of the Islamic paradigm when it comes to self-development. And number four, the Islamic paradigm of personal development is finding a balance between Qadr and Ihsan. Qadr, believing that Allah has already written out our destiny. Ihsan, working to the best of your abilities regardless of that. So we already know that Allah has written everything that will happen till the day of judgment. Still, we will work for Jannah with Ihsan. We will work for this dunya with Ihsan. We will work on ourselves with Ihsan. We will serve our families with Ihsan. We will serve this Ummah with Ihsan. We will do everything to the best of our abilities. The Prophet wasallam said, Allah loves that whenever a servant does anything, he does it with Ihsan, right? Ihsan means excellence or perfection. It means to do the absolute best job that you can do. So we have to find this balance. We, on one hand, have to accept that whatever happens to us is Qadrullah. So if you write a book and only 100 people buy that book, Qadrullah. I serve the Ummah through that book. That book is beneficial. That book helps people to achieve the purpose of life. I put in Ihsan in writing that book. How many books get sold is now Qadrullah. So you do the absolute best you can and what is beyond your capabilities, you leave it to Allah. So these four things make up an Islamic paradigm that when we focus on developing ourselves, it's not developing ourselves for materialistic reasons or for the sake of our egos. It's to help us to worship Allah. It's to help us purify our souls. It's to help us to refine our character. It's to help us serve this ummah and it's to help us live a life of ihsan. If we can do these five things, then we can become the absolute best versions of ourselves in a way that benefits us dunya in this world and the next. So in light of that, I've put together a four-step plan, right? A four-step plan to help us to, um, to, to read anything written by non-Muslims on this topic and to analyze it uh, through an Islamic filter. So obviously, I'm not going to tell you don't read the non-Muslim books on this topic. But there's a lot of benefit we can take from their books. Right, so there are a lot of non-Muslim books on this topic, uh, on these topics that are beneficial. But what I would say is, read them through an Islamic filter, read them critically, analyze anything you find in these books the Islamic way. And I myself use four things to analyze any book on personal development, and I'm going to share all four them with you today, so that inshallah you can start doing so as well. So again. I do not discourage you from reading books. I simply encourage you to read them through an Islamic filter. What is that Islamic filter? Four things, our Aqidah, our Fiqh, our Tazkiyah, and our Akhlaq. Our beliefs, our laws, our purification of the soul, and our character. These four things must be used to filter out the good from the bad from books written by other people. So we can take what's Islamic and leave what contradicts Islam, right? So number one is our Aqidah. Whenever you read a book on personal development, make sure you first analyze it from an Aqidah perspective because there are things in there that contradict our Aqidah. Like what? Like the idea that you are in charge of your own destiny. You will find this in many books on self-confidence. You'll find this in many books on wealth that you are the captain of your own ship. You are in charge of your own destiny. You decide what's going to happen with your life. As Muslims, we do not believe this. We believe in Qadrullah. Allah is the one who's in charge. He gives us all an area of free will. And what we do in that area of free will, will be, we will be rewarded for it or punished for it based on our choices. But we are not in charge of our destinies. We don't decide when we are born, when we are die, when we die, uh, 
you know, what kind of families or countries we are born into. Uh, we don't decide how much wealth we are going to have, how much intelligence we are going to have, uh, what, uh, you know, what we're good at, what we're bad at. All of this is Qadr Allah. All we get to decide is what to do with whatever Allah has gifted us with, right? And that's what we are either rewarded or punished for. So we have to use an Islamic paradigm here and we have to use our aqidah to filter out these kind of ideas which contradict our beliefs in Qadr, our belief in Allah or anything of that nature. Another example of something that contradicts the Islamic uh, aqidah that you find in books of personal development is the idea is, oh, if you just think that I am rich, you will become rich. If you just think I'm successful, you will become successful. This is a very problematic. And this goes back to, to what I mentioned earlier about pseudoscience. Someone just made this up and lots of people copy them and people begin to think it's true. In reality, this cannot be proven is, uh, uh, through science. This cannot be proven through psychology and this contradicts Islam as well. So Muslims should not have anything to do with such an idea. It is not an Islamic idea at all, right? Rather, we believe in Qadr Allah and we believe in Husnu Zan Billah to think good about Allah and to make dua to Allah but also to accept the qadr of Allah. So our aqidah plays a very important role in separating what we can and can't take from these books. Number two is our fiqh. So you have to analyze the advice given in these books from a perspective of halal and haram. The most obvious example, almost any personal development book which has a chapter on finance will tell you that the easiest way to get wealthy is through compound interest. That if you just keep piling up interest in your bank account, you will get rich beyond your dreams. What's the problem here? It's haram. It is haram. Maybe you will get rich, but there'll be no barakah in that money. And the day of judgment, you'll have to answer to Allah for how did you earn it. And your answer is not going to be one that, that leads to paradise. So we have to be careful of, of these kind of books that you'll find many of these books uh, because they are written uh, by people who are from a capitalist uh, mindset, they don't they don't have any idea of halal and haram. For them, it's all about what's the fastest way to get wealthy. And for us, it's how do I earn blessed wealth? How do I earn risk that has barakah in it? How do I earn sustenance that has barakah in it? That is that is what we should be focused on. Not how do I get wealthy, but how do I get wealth that, that is blessed by Allah and uh, blessed to Allah and pleasing to Allah. And so on the day of judgment where Allah asks us, how did you earn it and how did you spend it? We can answer both of those questions in a good way. So we have to be very careful here that when we're reading these books, what they ask us to do, we have to check, is it halal or is it haram? And we have to use our fiqh to filter out any advice that is haram, like the advice to accumulate compound interest. Number two is our dazkiyah or tasawwuf, our purification of the soul. And this is very simple. Any advice you find in a resource on personal development, ask yourself, is this going to improve me spiritually or is it going to negatively impact my spirituality? This is a very important question. Is this going to improve me spiritually or is it going to negatively impact my spirituality. So for example, if a book on personal development is making you greedy, that is bad for the state of your heart. And you have to find a way to get rid of that, right? If a personal development resource is making you jealous, jealousy is one of the worst things for our personal development in terms of Islam, in terms of our spiritual development. So we have to be very careful with that as well. So we have to be continuously uh, doing muhasaba, right? Taking stock of ourselves that this part that I'm going down, is it having a, a, a good or a bad impact on the condition of my soul? Because if we open the door for something that has a bad impact on the condition of our soul, then we are now slowly heading down the path that is displeasing to Allah. It begins with greed, it descends into jealousy, it ends in a major sin. Or sometimes it even ends in kufr. Because we know that the kufr of shaitan began with jealousy. That he was jealous of Adam alayhi salam. So we have to be very careful here. That the impact of these books on our souls. 
the impact of these videos on our souls. And I'll give you an example. A lot of the personal development YouTube channels, right? They feature, a lot of them have this cliche feature of a guy in a huge mansion who owns a jet and owns a private boat. And he's always boasting about all of this and showing off his art collection and showing off all these things. And if you are watching these videos every day, you may begin to get jealous of this person. You may begin to want what he has. And this is not good for our spirituality. So we have to take a step back and ask ourselves, hold on, is any of this even necessary? Do I actually need to own a speedboat? Do I actually need to own a private jet? Why am I jealous? You know, because th th this isn't the path to Jannah. This isn't something that's pleasing to Allah. So maybe it's better if I don't watch this person's videos and I watch someone else's videos instead. So we have to be constantly looking at things through the filter of purification of the soul. And finally, our akhlaq, our character, our manners, anything that causes us to go against the akhlaq of Islam, we cannot follow it, right? So for example, if a book comes from an individualistic mindset, the author may tell you like, oh, what your parents think doesn't matter. You know, rebel against your parents, prove them wrong. You know, chase your dreams no matter what. And that may inspire a person to break ties with his family, to disrespect his parents or something of this nature. Uh, this is un-Islamic, right? This is un-Islamic. Uh, we have to, if even when pursuing our own goals, we have to maintain Islamic akhlaq, maintain good relationship with our parents, maintain our family ties, take care of people, be good to people. So if, if this book's inspiring you to, um, to mistreat someone, uh, if it's inspiring you to cut corners, if it's inspiring you to put somebody outside of business so that you can do well in your business, all of this goes against the akhlaq of Islam. And if it goes against the akhlaq of Islam, then we as Muslims, we cannot accept it. So these are the four filters I use. Whenever I uh, analyze anything uh, from a, uh, you know, we're putting together Islamic uh, resources on personal development, Whatever it is I'm analyzing, I look at it from the perspective of Aqidah, Fiqh, Tazkiyah, and Akhlaq. And of course, you have to at least have basic knowledge of these four things to be able to do that. But the good news is you don't really need advanced knowledge of these four fields to be able to recognize the mistakes in personal development books. We just need basic knowledge. Inshallah, I hope all of us at least have the basic knowledge to be able to read these books uh, with a critical mindset. have one more slide to present and then inshallah we will open uh, the uh, lines for our Q&A. So to conclude, let's look at things from an Islamic approach. The Western approach to personal development comes from this idea that life has no purpose and you have to invent your own purpose and you have to uh, you know, do your own things uh, and, and come up with your own ideas and make your own destiny. Uh, and it's all about you and you only have one life to so do whatever you want with it. Our approach is very different. Our approach is grounded in the Wahi. It is grounded in the Quran and Sunnah. It is grounded in the purpose of life. That we have these filters that allow us to separate uh, the good from the bad. So the first thing that we have to do as Muslims when it comes to personal development is that we have to filter it through these four lens, right? So the first step of the Islamic approach is that anything that we study in this field, and by the way, you can use the same thing for other fields as well, uh, like business, um, psychology, or uh, any of these modern fields which are beneficial. Uh, the believer takes the good but he also analyzes it through an Islamic filter. So all of these things, we can analyze them through Aqidah. We can analyze them through Fiqh. We can analyze them through Akhlaq. We can analyze them through Tazkiyah. And using these four lens, we can take what is good and leave what is un-Islamic. And this is something we need to be doing all the time uh, and with every resource that we interact with, even if it comes from a Muslim author, because unfortunately, unfortunately I have read too many books and articles by Muslim authors where they have just taken ideas uh, from, from non-Muslim books and dressed them in an Islamic garb 
or uh, actually thinking about whether this is something that's acceptable according to our aqida or our fiqh. Uh, and so even when reading resources written by Muslims, we still have to use uh, these filters uh, because it may be that the author did not do so. Right, so we can't always take it for granted that every author is taking a similar approach. Many of them simply just take things from the non-Muslims and just dress it up as Islamic without changing anything. And that is very problematic. So number one, use these four things for filtering any knowledge that we take from other resources. Number two, focus on something, on things that benefit you in both worlds. So if we go back to the, de the definition of personal development, it's about being, it's about growing into the best version of yourself. Now, the Western paradigm is the best version of yourself for the dunya. But as Muslims, what's the dua that the Quran teaches us to make? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. Oh Allah, give us the best of this world and the best of the next world and save us from the hellfire. The best of both worlds. That's what we make dua for. So the Islamic approach to personal development is grounded in the idea that anything I do must benefit me in both worlds. I cannot compromise. If I have to compromise, I will choose the next world over this. I will never compromise the next world for this world. So ideally, we will look for things that benefit us in both worlds. Uh, so for example, I'll give you ideas of this. Uh, if you start a business that's beneficial uh, and that helps people, uh, so the business on one hand, you are benefiting people, you are helping people. On the other hand, you are earning halal risk. Um, and on top of that, on the day of judgment, when you are asked about how did you earn your wealth, you actually have not just a halal answer, but a beneficial answer. So your business actually becomes a good deed on your scale of good deeds because you were benefiting people with every transaction. And so uh, this now benefits you in both worlds. Uh, likewise, things like writing books or, or you know, teaching classes, these things benefit us in both worlds. Um, and there are many other things like this um, that can benefit us in both worlds, that there are worldly rewards for it and there are Akhira rewards for it as well. So when we're looking at personal development from an Islamic perspective, there are levels to it. Highest level, try to find something that benefits you in both worlds. If you can't find something that benefits you in both worlds, then focus on what benefits you in the Akhirah. And if you find something that benefits you, the third level is you find something that benefits you in dunya without affecting your Akhirah, that's fine too. But once you find something that benefits you in dunya and it negatively impacts your Akhirah, that's where we draw the line. That's when we say, no, I'm not going to take that even though there is some dunya benefit to it. Right? So that's where we draw the line. So our Akhirah is always number one in our minds. That whatever I take, whatever I, uh, whatever, uh, I try to benefit from, it must not compromise my Akhirah in any way. So again, four levels. Number one, benefits us in both worlds, Alhamdulillah. Number two, benefits us in the Akhirah only, Alhamdulillah. Number three, benefits us in the dunya only, okay, khair, Alhamdulillah, that's good as well. Number four, Benefits us in dunya, harms us in the akhirah. Astaghfirullah. No ways. We're not going there. So keep this order in mind when filtering things that you have to deal with in this dunya. Number three is to analyze things from a maqasid perspective. Right? Uh, so what do we mean by a maqasid perspective? So the maqasid is sharia. Um, the goals of the sharia uh, is, this, uh, is a concept in fiqh that everything has either benefits or harms, or it has both. Actually, most things have both. And in, in Makassi Sharia, we call this the maslaha and the mafsada, the benefits and the harms. And the purpose of Islamic law is the attainment of benefit and the reduction of harm. So when we want to decide uh, on whether something is halal or haram, we look at what outweighs what. If the benefits outweigh the harms, it's usually considered halal. If the harms outweigh the benefits, it's usually considered haram. Right? For examples in fiqh, uh, why does Islam allow jihad? Uh, because the benefits outweigh the harms. Right? In specific context, with specific rules, etc., etc. You guys know what I'm saying. Right? I don't mean it in terms of all of that haram that some people are doing these days where their harms are actually outweighing the benefits. But the actual legitimate one done through a khalifa, through an Islamic system, 
Why did Islam allow it? Because the benefits outweigh the harms. What people are doing today in some countries, why is it haram? Because the harms outweigh the benefits, right? So we wait on the benefit and harm scale. Uh, we see this in other things as well. Why is smoking prohibited? Because the harms outweigh the benefits. Someone will say, oh, but smoking helps me relax. Yeah, but it's going to kill you. So the harms outweigh the benefits, right? So this is a scale that we use in fiqh for figuring out when something is appropriate and when something is not appropriate. And it helps us to, to decide what's halal and what's haram. And we can use the same scale for personal development. That if you want to pursue a goal, if you want to dedicate your life to a mission, if you have a dream, if you have something you want to work on, you're going to look at does the benefit outweigh the harms. And of course, benefits we are talking about as Muslims, benefits with dunya wal akhir, right? So sometimes something may have dunya benefits, but akhirah harms, and we don't want to go there. Rather, ideally, we're looking at something that gives us the best of both worlds, or at the very least, it benefits us in this world without affecting our akhirah in any way. So always weightings on a scale of maslaha and mafsada, benefits and harms, and anything that is more harmful than beneficial, stay away from it. Now, it's not always easy to figure out. Sometimes we make mistakes. Or sometimes only after we do something, we realize that it was harmful to us. You know, So we ask Allah for forgiveness and we try again. The beauty of our religion is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he forgives us and he uh, does not hold us accountable for what is beyond our capabilities as long as we tried our best. So weigh things on a scale of benefits and harms. Number four. If you are taking knowledge of this dunya, now this is very important, not just for personal development, but even now, for example, with, with this COVID-19 crisis, uh, a lot of people are just following conspiracy theories and, and you know wacky things that people are saying on their blogs and, 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 and forwarded WhatsApp messages. So as Muslims, we, we're supposed to go after knowledge that is grounded knowledge that is tested, knowledge that is proven. When it comes to our religion, then we go for authentic hadith and we go for the Quran. When it comes to our dunya as well, we go for science and psychology. We don't go for pseudoscience. We don't go for, for myths. We don't go for conspiracy theories. But even when it comes to dunya, we have to make sure our knowledge is authentic. And what is authentic dunya knowledge? It is proven science. It is proven psychology. It is things that can be proven, not things that someone is just making up. So it's the same with personal development, that don't just believe anything you find in a personal development book. Rather, if it is not contradicting Islam, and if the author can prove it through a psychology test or through science or something of this matter, that's even better. And that's something that we should consider uh, following, right? So if someone's developed a system uh, for growing a business into a successful business and it is a proven business model that works and it is halal and then you take it and you apply it to a business uh, that is beneficial for this ummah, then khair, bismillah, go ahead and do so. But if somebody else is hatching a scheme to get wealthy and you get caught up in that scheme because you didn't check whether it's grounded, you didn't check whether it's proven, didn't check how it works, then you know you become a, a victim of that scheme. You, it is your own fault for just following anything without actually checking whether it is proven or not. So as Muslims, we should not be foolish. Even when taking knowledge of this dunya, we must take knowledge that is proven and knowledge that is tested and not just things that people make up. Having said that, uh, I'm actually gonna contradict myself a little bit here and I'm gonna explain why. So. On one hand, we have to take things uh, that are proven. On the other hand, we should also leave room for experimentation in areas where it's halal to experiment. Uh, so in general, something that's proven to work should take preference over someone's theory. On the other hand, there's nothing wrong with experimenting with new ideas as long as they are halal. What do I mean by this? So I'll give you two areas in my life where I'm always experimenting with new ideas. Uh, number one is time management and number two is education. So I'm always trying to find ways to maximize my time and get the most out of my day. Is there anything haram about that? No. Uh, is this something that's proven by science? Well, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to prove it by doing experiments, right? So I'm basically you know, experimenting until I find something that works and then I write about it and share, share it with others. Uh, the other area where I do that is education. 
So I believe that the education system we have in place these days is terrible. It doesn't work, right? It causes people to memorize things for exams and forget things after exams. I believe it, has, it doesn't have practical value. So I am always experimenting with new methods of education. Now, does this go against Islam? No, Islam doesn't have a set method of education. It's left up to people to develop their own ways of teaching and studying and learning. And Muslims in the past have done this. Muslims were the first ones to establish universities and madrasas and uh, educational uh, medical colleges, you know? So Muslims experimented and came up with, with models of, of study that worked. So why can't we do the same thing today? So yes, if something's proven to work, if I find an education model for a specific subject that's proven to work, I will take it and I will follow it. But in another subject where I feel that the way people are teaching it today, it's, it's not working, I will experiment and experiment until I discover a way that works, uh, even if nobody else has ever done it before. So on one hand, we need to take knowledge that's grounded. On the other hand, where it's halal to experiment, there's nothing wrong with doing so because, you know, uh, we want to be leaders. We don't want to just be followers. In the, in the golden age of Islam, Muslims were the ones who came up with some of the absolute most amazing ideas that changed this world. And they did that through the experiments. Whether it was Ibn al haytams discovering of optics, whether it was al Khawarizmi's advancement of, of algebra, um, uh, whether it was uh, Abu Zaid al Balki's uh, concepts of, on depression and anxiety and how to deal with them, they had to. They did their own experiments, and that's what led to these great and amazing discoveries. So we should do the same today. So we aren't just people who take from this field, but we are people who contribute to this field as well. So the final point, which I will drive home again, and again, you may notice this point repeated in all of my books and all of my lectures, because this is the single most important thing to every Muslim. Do not allow anything to distract you from the purpose of life, whether it's a goal, whether it's a dream, whether it's a job, whether it's a money, whatever it is, our purpose in life is to worship Allah, and that takes precedence over everything else. And that is the ultimate paradigm from which we approach this entire field and every other field. So with that, I come to the end of my presentation and inshallah, we will now open the doors to Q&A. Subhanahu rabbil izi amma zifun wa salam al mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah uh, khairan Sheikh for your very uh, beneficial, uh, beautiful lecture. Uh, and uh, Alhamdulillah, Shaykh has beautifully presented the problems of modern personal development theories and the Islamic paradigm on this theme as well as the Islamic filters and Islamic approach. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. Uh, we pray to Allah to give us tawfiq uh, to act upon these valuable words, bismillahi ta'ala. Now we'll go for the question and succession, okay? So uh, I know uh, it is uh, being telecasted both in Zoom and Facebook Live. So we'll take questions from both Zoom and from our, our Facebook Live. Okay, Shaykh, so there is the first question. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Uh, in case of uh, in case of doing in in case of doing corporate jobs, often time doing extra work is treated with praise. In this case, how you will apply the concept of ihsan from Islamic perspective? Okay, I didn't hear the whole question. So he said, when doing a, a corporate job, uh, the extra work is treated with with praise. That suppose the boss becomes pleased, uh, pleased with someone who works. Okay, so you think the people just do extra work so that their boss will be pleased with them. So yes, how is yes. that put in with Ihsan? Yes, well, that yes. is Ihsan. I mean, that, that is Ihsan itself. Ihsan means that whatever you do, you're the best. <laughs> That's what Ihsan is. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if you're doing a job, if your boss is not pleased with you, you're not doing your best. Right. So uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, uh, you know, one of the problems we have today with, uh, when it comes to our intentions is that we don't understand what it means to have ikhlas niya, right? We think ikhlas niya means that even when it comes to dunya, we only do things for Allah. So we think we only work for Allah. So we feel bad uh, when we trying to please our boss or trying to please our spouse or trying to please our parents. We actually shouldn't feel bad about this. Uh, this falls under ikhlas niya. As long as our main goal is the pleasure of Allah, 
the pleasure of our boss, the pleasure of our parents, the pleasure of our teachers, the pleasure of our spouse is included in that because Allah is happy with us when we are fulfilling the uh, rights of our employees, uh, our employers, right? So remember in Islam, a job is a trust. It's an amana. So if you are doing the best possible job and your boss is pleased with you for that, you are fulfilling your amana. And that's something that's pleasing to Allah. So there's nothing wrong with that. And that actually is part of Ihsan or rather that is Ihsan when it comes to working a corporate job. Uh, next question. What is the relation between self-development and purification of soul? Okay. So self-development generally focuses on dunya. Right, uh, so you normally focus on things like managing your time, building your self confidence, achieving your goals, uh, becoming the best worker in your workplace, uh, these kind of things. And purification of the soul, that's gear out the soul wolf, that's focused more on the pleasure of Allah. So, cleaning your heart, improving your iman, improving your taqwa, improving your tawakkul, improving your shukr, improving your sabr all of that is purification of the soul. So, they are two different fields. Um, that's why in, in my website. Uh, I normally refer to Tazkiyah as spiritual development, not personal development, right? Because that's cleaning the inside and trying to get closer to Allah. Now, Islamic self-help or Islamic personal development is a merger between the two. So I believe there are many things that we can do that will benefit us in both worlds. So for example, time management, the Islamic way, includes praying all of your salah on time. So that is, on one hand, it's a, it's a spiritual development because you are praying all your salah on time. On the other hand, it's personal development because you are getting better at time management, right? It's the same with self-confidence, that in Islam, self-confidence comes from our relationship with Allah, that we trust Allah. Allah takes care of us. Allah has given us skills. Allah will help us to accomplish our goals if they are good for us. So there is a spiritual development angle to it that we are improving our taqwa, we are improving our tawakkul, we are improving our relationship with Allah, we are making dua, all of this is spiritual development. But also there is a personal development side to it in that all of this is making us more confident, it's making us work harder, it's making us achieve more in dunya as well. So originally they are separate, personal development, achieving your worldly goals, the spiritification of the soul, the achievement of the pleasure of Allah and the love of Allah. But when we merge them together into Islamic self-help, we can actually accomplish both at the same time. Jazakallah khair. Shaykh, uh, next question. What should be the first book we should read for self-development in Islamic way? Okay, so the first book to read on self-development the Islamic way, uh, that's... Oh, difficult question because there's uh, firstly this is a very new field um there isn't as much written in this field as i would like um now i know my main book that i would have recommended i don't think it's available in bangladesh yet uh so maybe one day it will be but that's my book on the productivity principle of umar bin abdul aziz so that's that's uh that book is uh, grounded in history and it covers 15 productivity principles and that's really those 15 principles give you your foundation uh upon which you can analyze any other book for now from what's available in uh, locally i think my books on time management and self-confidence those are a good starting point as well as i don't know if it's available there uh the productive muslim is it available in your country the book the productive muslim are you aware of when it's available Let's see if i have a copy here uh so muhammad faris from the productive muslim.com he's written a really good yes, book called the productive this muslim book is available and these and this book has been translated in Bengali as well. Okay, mashallah. Excellent, excellent. So so that's your other starting point, right? Uh, so if I'm going to go with an author besides myself, uh, that, that's the other author whose books, uh, whose one book that he has written on this topic is, is truly beneficial. Uh, you, maybe you can start with his book. So inshallah, read The Productive Muslim, and then read my books on time management and self-confidence. And inshallah, if my book on productivity principles comes out there as well, read that uh, as well. Um, in the meanwhile, you can try getting a hold of the buying the PDF from my website or uh, so you know, find some other way to get it, inshallah. Um, as for other books in the field, as I said, this is a relatively new field. 
uh, the self-help field itself only came about less than 100 years ago. Uh, and the Islamic self-help is probably less than 10 years old. Uh, it's entirely a, a new concept. So there aren't that many books written in the field. And sadly, many of the other books I read in this field, the authors didn't do a good job uh, in the sense they just took what was written by the non-Muslims and they just put Islamic dressing on it without actually getting into uh, a proper Islamic filter. Uh, if there is one more author whose books I would recommend, uh, it's from India. Uh, that's uh, Mirza uh, Yawarbek. So I don't know if Sheikh Yawarbek's books are available in your country, uh, but his books on personal development, uh, on business specifically, are very beneficial. Uh, so I would, uh, inshallah, recommend those it's books only as well. The books of leadership lesson from the life of Rasulullah and another book on marriage. Uh, these two books are available in Bengali. In, okay, this in, book on, on, on the leaders' revelations on the life of Rasulullah, that, that's a great Rasulullah. starting point. Yeah, because that book gives you a lot of the foundations about, about what the Islamic paradigm is. So yeah, that's an excellent book to start with, inshallah. There's another question. Uh, the problem that I feel with personal development is consistency. Sheikh, can you give us some tips on how can we be consistent and committed? So the best way to grow consistent at something is actually found in the Hadith. The Prophet وسلم, is narrated by Aisha عنها, that the Prophet وسلم, said, Allah loves deeds that are consistent even if they are small. So in this hadith, we get the, the primary principle of consistency. And this actually is the, uh, this is a primary principle of purification of the soul, but we can apply to personal development as well. So when it comes to purification of the soul, how do you get better at something? through small actions, right? This is the mistake we make. Somebody wants to be pious, they wake up the next morning and they pray eight rakats of the hajjud or they try and read six Jews of the Quran in one day. And what happens is within a week, they give up, it's too hard. So the problem is you went too big, too fast. Rather, you start with something small and you make it a habit and then you add something else. So for example, uh, if someone's not praying the sunnah salah, just tell yourself, I'm going to start praying two sunnah before Fajr every day. And just focus on that and be consistent on that until it becomes a part of you. Then you say, okay, that's consistent now. So let me start praying the four before Zuhr as well. So you're now gradually improving and adding layers of good deeds to your life. Now the same thing is going to apply to personal development. Someone reads a book on time management and they want to apply all of those principles in one day. That's not going to happen. Nobody can change overnight like that. You have to take small dosages, take one thing at a time, be consistent on that one thing until it becomes a habit and then move on to number two. So for example, if you find that you are wasting too much time on social media, so just focus that one thing, I'm going to cut down on my social media time and make a plan for that and be consistent on that until you find that you are alhamdulillah not spending as much time on social media as you used to, then you move on to something else. Our problems are the number one, we try to change too much too quickly. Uh, number two, we expect too much from ourselves. And number three, this is the biggest problem, uh, especially from the part of the world where we are from, uh, we expect perfection of ourselves and our family members. Right? But expecting perfection from anyone is going to end in disappointment. So many of us, when we want to become practicing Muslims, we expect perfection from ourselves. And as soon as we commit a sin, we, we, we lose hope. No one's perfect. Every son of Adam makes mistakes. We're not Ambiya, we're going to make mistakes. So don't expect that level of piety for yourself. Same with personal development. Someone said, I'm going to be the absolute best in the world at what I do. Then they make a mistake and they feel terrible and they feel like, you know, I'm, I'm not good at this. No, relax, start small and build up slowly. So again, go back to the advice of Rasulullah something small but consistent. That is your starting point. And you grow from there and you build from there. Don't aim, you know, so for example, if somebody's writing a book, don't go from someone who writes one line a day to trying to write 50 pages a day. It's never going to work. Rather, commit to one paragraph a day. And once you're consistent at that, commit to one page a day. And once you're consistent at that, then commit to two pages a day. And guess what? Within a year, you may be writing five pages a day. But you start small and you be realistic. This is the key point. You start small and be realistic and in Inshallah, you will find consistency in that, and Allah knows best. Uh, 
uh, uh, next question, Sheikh. We know you have four children and also a very busy schedule. How do you get Baraka in time? Any advice for Tulabul Ailman parents? Okay, so this is a challenge for everyone, myself included. Uh, how do you gain Baraka in time? Or how do you manage your time? Are two separate things. Baraka is a karamat, it's a miracle that Allah gives to whomever He wills. Uh, it's not something that we can just press a button and we get it. Uh, really, that's from Allah. The, the, how do you gain barakah in anything? By trying to live a life that's pleasing to Allah, by being sincere to Allah, by having tawakkul in Allah, by making dua to Allah. That's all about your relationship with Allah. right? The closer someone is to Allah, the more barakah they'll have in their wealth, their time, their life, everything else. So I would say the main way to get barakah in anything is to get a, build a strong relationship with Allah and to make dua for barakah. How many of us actually make dua for barakah? Right, to make dua to Allah, put barakah in my wealth, put barakah in my time, put barakah in my efforts, put barakah in, in, in my family. How many of us actually make these duas? You know, so if you're not making these duas, why, why would we expect it? So again, the actual barakah is a miracle. It is a karamat. It's one of the proofs that Islam is the true religion. It's the fact that people today experience this in their lives. And the only way to get that is to try and live a life that is pleasing to Allah. Now, as far as time management is concerned, again, you have to see where you are and work your way up slowly. Uh, everyone's different and no one's perfect at it, right? I myself am not perfect at it. I mean, I'm a research manager at the Yakin Institute. I'm running Islamic self-help. I'm writing my own books. I'm doing webinars. I'm making YouTube videos, doing the Juma lectures at my local masjid, teaching a local halakha, homeschooling my kids. Um, sometimes I mess up. Sometimes something gets ne neglected. Uh, sometimes uh, something falls through the cracks. Sometimes I don't do a good enough job. No one's perfect. Uh, the point is that you're trying your best. So some of the things I do that help me to manage my time, number one, I have a, a to-do list, right? So I have a to-do list for every day. These are the things I have to get done today. And I try my best to make time to get every single thing on the to-do list done. Number two, I keep a written journal. And in that journal, I have all of my deadlines and my times and when this is and when that is. And I work according to the journal and I make sure that everything is done at the right time. Number three, I schedule certain things for certain times of the day. So for example, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. for homeschooling my kids. So that time is blocked out. It's just me and my kids. Or 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. for writing my books. That time is blocked out just for writing books. So blocking out time in your day to do certain things. Uh, another thing you can do is cut down on your fun activities, right? Uh, and as we grow uh, older and, and wiser and more focused on the purpose of life, we really should be finding that joy in our work and not having to supplement that with too much other things. Uh, so if you are spending six hours a day playing video games or watching movies, you have to cut down, you know, because there, you could do maybe two or three hours of fun and have now you have two or three hours extra to, to focus on other things. Uh, so, you know, cutting down on our distractions is also very, very important. And one of the most important things we can do is start our days early. Start our days early and just fill it up with as much good things as possible. From the time we wake up till the time we, we go to relax, to just fill it up with as many good things as possible. Again, I can't, if I'm going to go into all of this, I'm going to end up giving a full-time management lecture now. Rather, I recommend everyone reads the book. Uh, it's all in there, how to do things the proper way. So that's my time management tips. As far as Baraka is concerned, ask Allah. Only Allah can grant us Baraka in anything. Just like Allah, Khair and Sheikh, uh, we have only four minutes left. And so this will be our last question that we'll be taking. So this question is, uh, Assalamu Alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, we do a lot for this dunya. Uh, so how to convert that as an act of worship? That is uh, what the sister wants to tell is, we have very limited time and we do a lot of work. So how we can convert that words as an act of worship as well? Okay, I'm actually writing a book on this topic at the at the moment. Uh, so <laughs> the book I'm writing is called Blessed Sustenance. And inshallah, it's going to talk about how to, to focus on uh, how to use our time that we spend making money in a way that earns the blessings of Allah and, and earns the pleasure of Allah and helps us in the Akhirah as well. Uh, so there are a number of things we can do. I'll just focus now on maybe three or four of the most important things. Uh, number one is our intention. So anything of this dunya that is halal can become a good deal with a good intention. And that includes work. So if you are going to work and your intention is, I am working to take care of my families, to help this ummah, uh, 
to, to fulfill my responsibilities for the pleasure of Allah. Every moment you spend working, inshallah, you'll be rewarded for it. So intention transforms any mundane act into an act of worship, and that includes work. So any job that you are doing, as long as it is halal, if you do it in uh, with the intention of pleasing, uh, pleasing Allah, if you do it with the intention of benefiting the ummah, if you do it with the intention of providing for your family, then inshallah, it can become a source of reward for us. Uh, number two, uh, the second way in which we can uh, make sure that our that our money is blessed and our and our money is going a long way. Actually, number two, the, the remaining three is actually found in one hadith. Uh, there's a beautiful hadith from the Prophet وسلم, that supplements this, where the Prophet وسلم, said that every deed we do will end when we die, except for three: money that uh, a charity that continues to benefit people, knowledge that we leave behind that continues to benefit people, and our children that make du'a for us. So what this this is doing is not talking about three things; it's talking about three channels, right? So we worried about are we working. How can we build our akhirah? Well, the key way to multiply your akhirah while working for dunya is to set up streams of revenue for the akhirah. Now many of us we have this idea of set, setting up our streams of revenue for this dunya. So people invest in stocks and and they pile up you know money in the bank accounts and they do all of these different things. But uh, as Muslims. Uh, what we can do instead um, is we all we should be ex investing money in the akhirah. So if you got any extra money, uh, you know you you start uh, investing it in things that will continue to multiply in the akhirah. So for example, you put a portion of your savings towards an orphanage, or towards a masjid, or towards an Islamic school, or towards a research center, or towards whatever it is. So every month you're putting a small portion towards that. That small portion on the day of judgment it's going to be huge. So you feel you are working for dunya, but your money is working for akhirah, right? This is the key, right? We always see the, see the modern self-help books, what they tell us is to make your money work for you. I say, make your money work for your akhirah. So in the olden days, um, when the golden age of Islam, we had the wakaf system. So everybody who had money, they would invest their money in their akhirah, not in their dunya, by setting up a wakaf. So somebody would, would buy off a building and dedicate that building for teaching Islam, or they would dedicate that building uh, for uh, as a hospital, or they would dedicate it as a shelter for widows and, and divorcees, or whatever it is. But they were using their money to invest in their akhirah. So they can go to work, they can focus on their business, they can focus on their careers. In the meanwhile, this other building is piling up their good deeds for them in the akhirah. And this is this is where the, all my other ideas come from, is that, yes, our time goes in working for dunya, so make our money work for the akhirah instead. Whatever little it is, don't think I don't have enough. Whatever little it is, even a tiny, tiny amount of money that is spent in the part of Allah, you know, even a half a date given in sadaqah, when it is done with ikhlas, it can go a very long way as it as it works its way, you know, through the lives of people and benefits people. So that is the other way in which we can benefit people. Uh, we can continue to grow our akhirah while we are working. Number three is to do things that are beneficial for this ummah with our spare time, right? So we said knowledge that we leave behind that benefits people. So if you have you know, weekends off or evenings off or Sundays off or whatever it is to dedicate an hour a week for benefiting the ummah, uh, whether it's counseling people, whether it's volunteering at a local uh, organization, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, teaching your neighbor's children, whatever it is, just find at least one project in your life where you are passing on beneficial knowledge to somebody else. So that now whatever good deeds that person does is now being added to your scale of good deeds. So you are going to work, but that person is piling up your good deeds for you while you are at work. And then, of course, number four is our own children. And that is if we raise children who are righteous believers, then inshallah, any good deeds they do, we also get the reward. So we could be going to work and one of our kids may inshallah become a great scholar of Islam. Guess what? While you're working, whatever work that scholar of Islam is doing, you're getting the reward for it as well. So there are many, many ways in which we can go to work and focus on our dunya careers while piling up for the akhirah as well. These are just a few of them. And inshallah, hopefully, I'm hoping sometime over the next five or six months, my book on this topic will be out as well. And yeah, that's my next focus, inshallah. So I hope that you find this terms beneficial. 
Jazakallah khairan Sheikh and Alhamdulillah uh, we have come to the end of our session. I think we all have been benefited from the wonderful uh, lecture on self-development as per the Sunnah way followed by a beautiful question and succession. Alhamdulillah Jazakallah khairan Sheikh uh, for uh, keep uh, accept our invitation uh, in his, uh, on behalf of Itcon Institute and for your busy schedule we know you are very busy using your uh, tafsir programs, writing books and uh, other programs as well. But we are very, very happy that you have kept your invitation and we hope that in future we'll be also uh, be benefited. We want to be benefited from you, from your valuable uh, lectures and your works, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khairan Sheikh. Inshallah, we'll continue to work together, inshallah. Jazakallah Sheikh for having me. May Allah accept. Barakallah fikum, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. So here today, uh, we are, I think we can finish the session now. Jazakallah khairan. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.